Brother Kirkendall was a pastor in Texas. And H.Z. Duke was the founder of Duke and Heirs Nickel Stores. He was a millionaire. One day he asked Brother Kirkendall if Brother Kirkendall believed in tithing, to which the pastor replied that he did believe in tithing. Then Mr. Duke asked him, do you practice tithing? And the pastor said, no, I do not. He said, I believe in tithing, but I cannot practice it. You see, I have 13 children at home. Every meal, 15 of us sit down at the table. I, I receive $125 a month as a pastor, and I have to maintain my own horse and buggy for constant traveling. It's just impossible to take care of all the needs of a family of 15 people on $125 a month and have anything left over to give. So I, I believe in tithing, and, and I preach it, but I cannot practice it. Mr. Duke then said to him, I want you to give God at least $12.50 every month as soon as you get your salary. Then as you feel led, you give more. And I promise you that if you need any help, I will give it. Simply write me a letter and say, Brother Duke, I am giving the tithe, but I missed the money. I need it from my family. I have given X amount of dollars this year. And I promise you that I will send you a check by return mail to cover your expenses. Are you willing to try tithing on that basis? Brother Kirkendall was very excited at this offer. He began tithing. And as the year went by, God took care of his needs in unexpected ways so that he never actually had to send the letter to Mr. Duke. Near the end of the year, he realized something. He realized that he had trusted Mr. Duke's promise to provide for him more than he had trusted God's promise. He said, I'd taken the word of a man when I did not take the promise of God and now I have proven God's promises and found that God took care of me and my big family on a small salary. I found that $112.50 per month took better care of my family with God's blessings than $125 did without it. In life, we've got a lot of things we have to decide, a lot of choices to make. We have to decide who and what we are going to trust. We can trust in ourselves. We can trust in other people, we can trust in money, we can trust in the government, or we can trust in God. We need to know that trusting in anything other, anyone other than God, is foolishness. God has made promises. God has offered blessings. As Christians, we should know what these promises are. We should know the blessings God is offering to us. We should understand just how secure His promises and His blessings are. Today, we're going to look at a list of names, a genealogy. And we need to understand this genealogy serves to connect some of God's promises to the blessings. I'd like you to turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 11, where we're going to be again in verse 10. These verses are also found in your bulletins. Moses had just told the audience how the descendants of Noah had disobeyed God, how they'd refused to spread out and fill the earth, how they'd gathered together to build a city and a tower so that they might make a name for themselves. And God had confused their language and scattered them all over the earth. Moses continues, Genesis 11, starting in verse 10. These are the records of the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and became the father of Arpashad two years after the flood. And Shem lived 500 years after he became the father of Arpashad, and he had other sons and daughters. Arpashad lived 35 years and became the father of Shelah, and Arpashad lived 403 years after he became the father of Shelah, and he had other sons and daughters. Shelah lived 35 years and became the father of Eber, and Shelah lived 403 years after he became the father of Eber, and he had other sons and daughters. God's patience is amazing. One of the things that genealogies like this should help us to understand is God's patience. God's plan for salvation was formed before time began. God knew mankind would fall in the garden. God already knew Christ would come and live a sinless life. He knew Christ would die on the cross to pay for our sins. He knew the names of every single person in history that would ever trust in Christ's death for salvation. And yet, he was so vastly patient 
that he allowed so many generations of men to be born, to live, to have children, and to die. Now understand this. God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and at any point, he could have skipped all the stuff in the middle. He could have jumped right from the garden to the cross. That's what I would have done. I'm not very patient. See, but in this patience of God is immense love for all mankind. Patience with all our sin. Patience with all our failure. Patience with all our disobedience. And understand this. The patience is not for his benefit. He doesn't gain anything by waiting all these generations. This patience is for our benefit. To help us come to relationship with him. To give us time to lean on, trust on, depend on him. This genealogy starts with Shem, who Noah pronounced as blessed. And this genealogy will trace the line from Shem to Abram. The main purpose of this is to connect the blessings on Shem to Abram. The Babel account, if that had been the end, if, it, if the Old Testament early stories had stopped at Babel, how would we possibly understand how we got from complete failure to obey God to the one God would choose to bring forth the nation of Israel? Something's got to connect them. We need to know how we got from point A to point B. Now, some folks, biblical scholarly kind of theologians, want to say that this genealogy has gaps in it. That there has to be more time between Shem and Abram. They base this idea on the fact that the phrase became the father of. Sometimes in Hebrew literature, that phrase doesn't just mean literally the father. It means the ancestor of. It can mean the grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-great-grandfather. But if we look at this particular genealogy, we see this phrase connected to another phrase. Every time it says became the father of, it also says lived X number of years. And in all of Hebrew literature, anywhere we look, anytime these two phrases are used together, lived so many years, became the father of, it means literally the father. Not the grandfather, not the great-great-grandfather, not an ancestor of, it's literally his father. And there's not really any reason to need to think there's gaps in here. Matter of fact, there's a reason to think these are the right names in the right order. First of all, God says they are. Amen. But second, there's an interesting connection between this genealogy and the genealogy before the flood. In that genealogy before the flood, we see the line from Adam to Noah. And in that genealogy, there are exactly ten names. In this genealogy here, there are ten names from Shem to Abram. Both of these genealogies use a similar format. They state how long each man lived, and then it says they fathered father the next man in the genealogy, and both had the phrase, and he had other sons and daughters. Both of these genealogies end with a listing of the three sons of the last man in the line. But there is one interesting little difference between these two genealogies. In the genealogy back in chapter 5, before the flood, we see the phrase, and he died. After every man in the line but Enoch. And in this genealogy, we don't have that phrase, and he died. I think this is because it stresses the difference between the world before the flood and the world after the flood. The world before the flood was headed for destruction, was headed for death. The world after the flood is headed towards salvation. It's headed towards the cross. Mankind is headed towards the cross. But mankind is heading there very slowly, at least by the way we measure time. But we've got to remember, 2 Peter 3.8 says, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Maybe this is part of where God's patience comes from. Maybe this is how he can be so immensely patient. He just doesn't see time the same way we do. There was a New England preacher named Philip Brooks. He was known for his calmness, for his patience, for his poise. But his close friends, the people that really knew him, they knew that he suffered moments of frustration, irritability, and impatience. One day a friend of his saw him walking back and forth in the church down the main hallway, pacing like a lion, just looking all kinds of impatient. And he said, Dr. Brooks, what, what's the problem? And the trouble with pride, Brooks, is that I'm in a hurry but God isn't. 
I want you to think about this. It took God six days to create the heavens, the earth, the moon, the sun, every living thing. In one day, he fashioned man in his likeness before the fall. And then since the fall, more than 6,000 years, God has been working to restore us to him. That's some patience. It's not for our benefit. I mean, it's not for his benefit. It's for ours. He's given us time. He's allowing for everybody that ever will trust in Jesus to have time to trust in Jesus. Part of trusting in Jesus Christ is understanding God's patience. We look at the world and we see evil and suffering and strife and pain and difficulty and anguish and conflict. And we want something done about it now. But the truth is, God is currently doing something about it right now. He's doing it very patiently. He's doing it in such a loving way as to allow every single individual that will ever trust in Christ time to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Genesis 11, starting in verse 16. Eber lived 34 years and became the father of Peleg, and Eber lived 430 years after he became the father of Peleg, and he had other sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and became the father of Ru, and Peleg lived 209 years after he became the father of Ru, and he had other sons and daughters. Ru lived 32 years and became the father of Sarug, and Ru lived 207 years after he became the father of Sarug, and he had other sons and daughters. God uses people to progress his plan. Some of the more interesting names in this genealogy appear in this section. We see the name Eber mentioned here. The Hebrew people are called the Hebrew people after the name Eber. In, in the Hebrew language, Hebrew means Eber's people. And then we have Peleg. His name means divided. He's mentioned back in Genesis 10.25. Two, uh, two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Most scholars take this to mean that Peleg was born shortly after God confused the language and divided mankind. And the truth is we really don't know much about the people in this genealogy. Most of them are only mentioned here or in some other genealogy. We don't know the details of their lives, but we do know they served God's plan in a very important way. They were the links between Noah and Abram. See, that's one of the most interesting things about God's plan. He uses people to move the plan along. Some people do great things in the plan. Noah, Abram, Moses. Others serve actively in the plan. Joshua, Gideon, Samuel. And some people serve God's plan by being links, by connecting other folks in the plan. Now, we may be tempted to think less of those that only serve as a link. Our society, we want to value the mighty man that does the great work and not realize without the links between them, there won't be no mighty men that do the great works. We need to remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 15 through 18. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desires. Those that serve God's plan as links in the plan have been placed just as God desires them to be placed. We cannot know to what extent we ourselves are serving as links. Maybe some number of generations from now, some descendant of ours is going to serve God in some mighty way. We should always serve God to the best of our ability. We should raise our children and our grandchildren to know God. But we should also be aware that we may be serving God as a link to someone that will come after us, someone who has a much bigger part in God's plan than we could ever imagine. God's plan includes all of us. 
There is none that Gad cannot use to accomplish his plans. Moses the murderer, Samson the guy with the big mouth, Joshua the liar, Joseph the braggart, Abraham the lying coward, David the adulterer and killer, Rahab the prostitute, Gideon the gutless wonder, Peter the betrayer of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul the persecutor of the church. God chooses the least likely things to do the greatest things. And some he chooses to be links in his plan. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. When we trust in Christ, we become a part of God's plan. Because we are now God's people, we are children of God, we are citizens of heaven, we need to be about his business. It needs to be the focus of our lives, doing his will, working his plan, serving him in whatever capacity he might call. Genesis 11, starting in verse 22. Sirug lived 30 years and became the father of Nahor, and Sirug lived 200 years after he became the father of Nahor, and he had other sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah, and Nahor lived 119 years after he became the father of Terah, and he had other sons and daughters. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. God makes promises. One of the primary purposes of all the genealogies we find in the Bible is to connect a promise of God to the fulfillment of that promise. This particular genealogy is actually connecting two promises. In the local context, the promise of the blessing on Shem is being connected to Abram, who will be part of that promise being fulfilled. A great nation will come out of him. In the grand plan of God, this genealogy connects the promise that God made in the garden right after the fall to the cross. That promise God made in the garden is found in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. That's the first mention of a savior. That's the first mention of somebody that's going to fix the fall. It is said here that the seed of Eve, not the seeds, but the individual seed of Eve, Jesus Christ will bruise or really crush the head of Satan. This is sometimes called the proto or the pre-gospel. This is God promising that the fall will be repaired, that we will be restored to relationship with God. All throughout the Old Testament, we see connections made between Adam and Christ. Links like this genealogy that show how God connects the garden to the cross. At the end of this list, we see Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Despite the threats and detours of 11 chapters of murder and floods and building towers and being scattered, the promise of a Savior has been kept alive by the forbearance, by the patience of God. You see, God's promises are rock solid. I don't do well with fragile things. She's laughing. The first year we were married, I broke our toasting goblets from our wedding three times. When I was a little kid, my dad would brag to folks, that boy could break a ball bearing. The first time I broke a ball bearing on my skateboard, he got quite a kick out of that. Some things are like toasting goblets. They're fragile. They're easily broken. Uh, other things are, are durable, but we break them because we work them too hard. We rely on them too much. We lean on them harder than they can handle. 
We need to understand you cannot break God's promises by leaning on them too hard. God's promises are infinitely durable. God's promises are based on who he is and not who we are. We can lean on them with all our might, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and God's promises will not break. Amen. God made a promise back in Genesis 3.15. He promised that the seed of Eve would crush the head of Satan. For God to see to it that that promise would be fulfilled, he had to get the world from Adam to Christ. Part of getting from Adam to Christ is getting from Noah to Abram. The men listed in this genealogy are how God got from Noah to Abram. From the flood to the calling out of one man to leave his home and go where God called him to go and establish the nation of Israel. The Bible is filled with the promises of God. We became the children of God when we trusted in the promise that Christ died to pay for our sins. We need to know as children of God that God had this plan before time started. And we have the choice to trust in ourselves, in other people, in money, in the government, or to trust in God, to trust in his plan, to trust in his promises, to trust in his blessings. <coughs> God is vastly patient in how this plan unfolds. He has to be patient because he uses people, flawed, broken, sinful people to work his plan. And we might think that means the plan is in danger of not happening. But even though God uses flawed people to carry out the plan, we can trust that it will happen because God made a promise. One of the greatest promises God has offered us is that if we have faith, if we trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that his death paid for our sins, then we have eternal life. This is the promise we are trusting in when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. If there is anyone here today who has never placed their faith or trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and we're going to sing a song. And During that song, I'd love for you to come forward and place your faith and trust in Jesus. Additionally, if anybody needs prayer, it would be wonderful if you came down and I might pray for you. And finally, if anybody desires membership, this is the appropriate time to come forward for membership for this church. Father God, you are awesome and mighty, worthy, holy, sovereign, Lord of lords, King of kings. Father, we thank you that you not only make promises, but you fulfill promises. Your word is rock solid. Father, help us to choose to trust it daily in everything we do, to lean on you, to rely on you with our heart, our mind, our soul. Father, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.